Welcome to the Apartment Investor Show, where we help you get smart and invest smarter in multifamily real estate. I am your host, JC Castillo, founder and managing principal of the Multifamily Property Group. And joining me as always is my good buddy, my co-host, the godfather of lending, Mr. Paul Peebles, national underwriter for Old Capital Lending. Paulie, how are you doing today? I am doing great, uh, JC. Uh, we're going actually going to rebroadcast this on the Old Capital podcast too, because we think it's some great information that uh, our guest is going to bring to us. So I'm looking forward to uh, sharing some of his knowledge with everybody about what's going on in the multifamily side uh, of multifamily third-party management. And so on the podcast today, we have a friend of ours that we've known for a long period of time. He has been on uh, our podcast maybe one or two times. And we thought we'd bring him back during this, 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 this coronavirus times. I don't think there's anything else we can call it. Maybe it's a crisis, but uh, we wanted to bring in Ryan Wainer uh, into the podcast and kind of leverage some of his experience on what uh, he, is, he is thinking so it could help not only investors, but also general partners how to deal with some of these challenging uh, times. And so I'd like to, to welcome Ryan Wainer onto the podcast. Thanks for coming on board, Ryan. Hey, thank you for inviting me. Give us a little bit of a yeah. Really give us a little, look forward to. It. Yeah, give us a little background on you in the uh, how long you've been in property management and how many uh, units you guys manage. So I've been. I uh, started Wayner Multifamily uh, roughly two thousand seven, two thousand end of two thousand six, two thousand seven. Actually, didn't incorporate till the beginning of two thousand eight. Um, Started with basically my own properties that I, I came here and, and purchased. I, I grew up in Southern California and lived there till 2006. Um, and then uh, was brokering deals for other people out of Southern California and South Florida primarily. And, um, you know, kind of got pulled into property management in that 2007 uh, uh, time. And that's really when I started uh, managing my buildings and managing other buildings. I, I think uh, before the 2008-9 crisis, we were at, you know, maybe six or 700 units. And through that crisis, um, we, we ended up uh, 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 surviving the crisis and all the assets that I owned and uh, ended up expanding through it and found a lot of opportunities, both on the the uh, purchase side, but also uh, with regards to the management business. And uh, th that whole uh, crisis kind of spawned our uh, construction wing as well. Um, that, and then going forward, I mean, we haven't done a lot of, I mean, if you look back, we didn't do a lot of marketing or anything. It was just word of mouth, uh, working with uh, awesome people like, uh, like yourself, Paul. And you were a, a huge catalyst to some of our success and really appreciate that really always just focused on you know the mousetrap if you will just create the best mousetrap and then uh you know if you build it they will come if we have the right company the right people that uh that will that our business will grow and, and it worked that way we doubled about every two years through about uh 2018 uh, uh, 19. tell me how many units you guys manage right now we manage uh you know just that about twenty six thousand units uh, we are in, uh, you know, our, our headquarters is in Dallas, Fort Worth. I think we have uh, 17 or 18,000 units are there. We have a very large uh, presence in Oklahoma City, the MSA there. The, and then we have, um, you know, a, a couple or about 3,000 units in San Antonio, about a thousand, a little less than a thousand units in Austin. And then we're up up and down the I-35 corridor, you know, the Waco, Colleen Temple area. And then uh, just uh, recently we've entered the Tulsa market as well. Um, so you, you guys we have, some, uh, we have a few properties in Abilene and in Wichita Falls. Yeah. And our <laughs> properties are primarily workforce housing. So probably about 50, 55% of our, our portfolio is in that C to C plus range with the other roughly half uh, in the B range. Uh, we do have a handful of A's, but let's say it's probably less than 1% of our portfolio is A-class properties. Okay. 
So we're excited about having you on because you're a third party property management company. And then with JC, he does his own management. So he kind of knows his numbers and then you kind of have just general knowledge of how your portfolio mm -hmm. is performing. So Ryan, I'm going to ask you this question first and then I'll throw it over to JC. How has April collections been for the portfolio overall? And I'll ask the same question to JC. We've already put together some uh, payment uh, plan opportunities, um, you know, not portfolio wide, but uh, probably on 85% of the portfolio where, um, you know, we're waiving late fees if they pay weekly. Um, you know, there's a lot of different uh, machination, uh, different mechanisms that we have with regards to that. But um, we are doing some payment plans. We did, uh, uh, on many properties, you know, at the end of March, say, look, if you pay before the end of the month for next month, you'll get a $50 uh, uh, credit or even a $50 discount. If you pay by the third, you'll get a $25 discount. Um, that's kind of, I know that was the first thing that we put in motion because to be candid, we had a lot of fear going into the, to April. Um, yeah. So I think everybody, at least in DFW, I know nationwide, about a third of the people haven't paid, but in DFW, particularly in, in our, um, in that workforce space that I think all of us kind of specialize in and invest in is, uh, I mean, I was a little bit pleasantly surprised on that. I do have a more pessimistic outlook for next month, um, considerably, um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, most of these lockdowns, uh, at least in Dallas, came in a little bit later in uh, San Antonio and Austin, Oklahoma. But most of these lockdowns happened, started, uh, the stay at home stuff started, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but more or less around the second week of March. Correct. First week, first week to the second week of March. And if you think about it, if people were furloughed or their hours were cut, um, they still had a payroll check coming. Typically payroll checks come, you know, a week to two weeks later. So I don't think that they've experienced all of their uh, financial stress as of the beginning of this month because they had kind of that money rolling in. And, uh, you know, now it's been a, you know, it's been, they're not getting another payroll check this, this week or next week, uh, you know, solid at least 25 30 percent of the of the tenants and so we really need to rely on whether they've had the savings or not and typically in that work in you know that 50 to sixty thousand dollar pay payroll I mean uh, salary or even you know uh, compensation that typically don't have a whole lot of savings um, we also have you know there there is some concern that um, you know People get a 1,200, and let's say there's a family, a, a husband and a wife, and you know, typically in our portfolio, a husband and wife are each going to make anywhere from 15 to maybe 30 dollars an hour. So you're looking at uh, you know, third, uh, collect, you know, making about 2,500 to 4,500 dollars a month. Um, and let's say you yeah, average those, we're looking at a household family making about $7,000, $7,500 a month. Now we're going to a situation where even with stimulus uh, checks, that might be, you know, $2,400 to if they have a few kids, maybe $3,500. So it's, it's going to cut at least in half what the, their average take home is. Now, granted, they're not spending money on gas and all these other things. But there's a lot of fixed costs in many of these households with with um, with how our society's kind of built on debt, and a lot of these people are living paycheck to paycheck to make payments. And so, we do have concern there. Um, and then to add to that, I don't want to be Debbie Downer. I just want people to be prepared for what may come in May. Is that in North Texas, in particular, in the workforce housing section, you know, all of us, uh, we get the correct, we get that we're not document experts, so tenants move in, we have their social security, uh, but we're in a, a region of the country where there is a heavily um, Hispanic uh, population, 
and um, you know, my my bet is that many of them are not uh, technically uh, United States citizens, and they won't be receiving these. I know AOC is trying to put get it to where they receive these stimulus checks, but they're typically not going to. Uh, my guess is they are not going to receive. Given our administration, I don't think they will be receiving these checks, and so that's another added level of risk. Having said that, the typical uh, um, uh, culture of people that were not born in this country or maybe are not here um, legally tend to save a lot more money. So we're just going to have to see how that works out. And you know, I'm I'm talking from a sample set of of you know 26,000 units. So any particular deal could be not as heavily impacted. Some will be more in, impacted. It just kind of depends. I wish I had a, a crystal ball and could tell you exactly what the collection rates are going to be next month. Yep. I think that uh, I think we're internally uh, underwriting that we have an expectation. I think the teams, the executive teams, expectation is that we're going to probably be even ten. We'll probably end up this month uh, fifteen points below. You know, ten to fifteen points below last month on average, and we think that's probably going to go down another ten percent uh, next month. It, it sounds right. So, JC, let me get your take on what uh, April collections are. And um, you guys just bought another property. So uh, tell us a little bit about the, the, your last acquisition and then go, let's go through the numbers. Yeah, the um, well, I'll, I'll talk about the April numbers first and then we can kind of cover the acquisition. Um, you know, since we're we're also going live on the old capital podcast, I'll sort of give a quick snapshot, right? So we are owner operators. So we actually are um, a, a a company that both owns and operates or third or manages our own portfolio. So we kind of see this whole coronavirus impact from sort of both sides of the coin. Um, there's a lot of owners out there that that work with third part, party property managers like Ryan, who do a great job as well. So. Um, you know, all of us owners, you know, talking on the ownership side, we're all sort of very concerned about what this, what this is going to look like in terms of the bottom line impact to our investments, uh, how it's going to affect our, affect our investors. Um, but also from the third party management side and also from our own management company side, we're also very concerned about how our customers, we, we call them customers, their residents, how the residents are being impacted. And so, you know, we have a lot of people that live at these properties that that are raising families um, and they're losing jobs. And this is a very uh, scary time and a real tough time for the residents. So um, having said that, um, you know, April collections for us were just like Ryan said, we were pretty, pretty worried about how they were going to come out in sort of April 1st. As soon as it hit, we already had a lot of um, KPIs or, um, you know, key performance indicators that we had created that would tell us um, how collections were going. Um, I think it's, it's a similar story to what Ryan said in the, in the sense that what we've seen from our portfolio is that we've been pleasantly surprised with um, how well collections have gone for April. Um, I've got some numbers in front of me, which I can rattle off to you. So um, we, uh, for, the fifth, for the 15th of the month, so collections to date for the 15th of the month of April, are about an at, they're at an average of ninety five percent of the billable rents. Okay, so meaning that you know all of the I'm not talking about you know fees and other income and stuff. I'm talking about just the billable rents. We've collected an average of ninety five percent to the fifteenth of the month for our portfolio, and if we look at the, the the trailing three months, let's say January through March, at that same fifteenth day of those average three months, we had collected ninety eight percent of billable rents. So you can see there's definitely been a drop off for us of it's 3%. Now I've been tracking this data since the 1st of April and what we've seen is that we've been averaging about a 4% dip in terms of day for day what we've been able to collect on average uh, on, in April versus the trailing three months. So that does tell us that we can definitely see some impacts. They haven't been as bad as we expected. We're very happy with where we're at. The other thing I can tell you is what we were more concerned about is not only what we've collected to date, which we, what we've collected to date is actually really good for April, 
but we're also concerned about the velocity of collections on the trailing part of the month. So, and Polly, you, you rightly pointed out that it's really more of a concern about what the, you know, let's say if there's 5% or 10% of, of delinquent rents outstanding still, and we're at the 15th of the month, you know, it's a big deal if those people are going to pay or not. And so is the velocity going to hold in terms of tracking that delinquency paid off, or is it going to start that to, to diverge where we're going to see a large majority of that delinquency that we typically close out by the end of the month is actually going to stay delinquent. And I think, you know, that for us, that's going to be uh, what we're going to be looking at the second half of the month is how is that velocity tracking to closing towards very little delinquency at the end of the month? You know, I don't want to throw everybody, everything into the, into the, the, the soup, but you know, there's differences between property types and property locations and areas outside of say Texas that we're in, but we're kind of specifically talking about kind of the Southwest here, but you know, we've had challenge challenges up in New York challenges on the West coast, but, uh, what do you see a different quality, quality of the asset itself? So we have A, B, C assets. You guys have a little bit of the B plus, A minus stuff, all the way down to the, say, the C plus stuff. Where do you see uh, the breakdown of collections between the, the quality of the asset? Yeah, it's a, it's a great, it's a great question, Polly. So, and we definitely have seen, um, we definitely have seen a variation across asset class. Um, uh, you know, I've got the numbers in front of me. I can tell you that, like, for example, um, with some of our sort of what we would call our C product, we're seeing, uh, for example, we've got some portfolio here that where we're seeing that um, we're only at 91% of collections to the 15th of the month. And we're normally at 95% by this date. So we can see that there is a drop off there. Um, I'm looking at another property where, where I would say this is more of a B asset and I'm seeing that there's been a 4% drop off. Um, so, you know, we're definitely seeing some variation, but to be honest with you, it's not, it's not that great in terms of like, it's not night and day. Like we're not seeing any properties that where we're having a 10% drop off in, in collected numbers to date. Um, so I, I do think that there is a dependency on asset class for sure. Um, but for my numbers, at least for April, we haven't seen a huge difference. But I think heading into May, um, where where Ryan was 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 also sort of thinking the same thing, I think we're going to see um, some more of a drop off there. So, JC, tell me a little bit about uh, you guys just bought a, another property and you closed in the middle of this thunderstorm. Why would you do that while well, everybody else has been bailing out of these transactions? <laughs> Well, yeah, Polly. I mean, it's a really good question. I mean, first of all, maybe we're just a little bit uh, off kilter here, fifty-one fifty style. But no, I mean, in all seriousness, um, we had sold another asset um, where we did really well with that asset, and so we were in a ten thirty-one exchange, and we had identified a property off market um, uh, that we were able to take down before it went to listing. The number looked looked really solid. We really liked the neighborhood, the area. It was a, it was a nice quality asset. Um, and of course, all the craziness happened right as we went into contract. Um, we were really uh, quite scared, to be honest with you, uh, really fearful about um, sort of what that was going to mean to the property. One of the things that we were lucky enough to do is that we've we've always been really aggressive with how we work with our lenders. And also, we have really deep relationships with our lenders. Uh, of course, Old Capital is is our partner here. And uh, what we did really uh, from the very beginning was we did a rate lock, streamlined rate lock uh, on the property. So we locked our interest rate. We locked all the terms with the lender. And, and by the time, literally the day we signed the contract, we already had everything done and we had deposited the rate lock. So uh, deposit. And so there was really nothing that changed about the loan. And that was really our saving grace because as, as you guys know, and, and probably as Ryan knows, um, I mean, financing went just crazy uh, during the uh, last several weeks. And so what had we not like, rate locked. Yeah. What was it like to take over a property in the middle, middle of this thunderstorm to, you know, knock on doors with tenants, let them know that there's a new owner, 
you know, trying to manage, manage through that. How, how tough has that been for you guys? Well, I think, you know, one of the blessings about this deal and, and, and we've done a lot of transactions and so it's always all over the map, but we had a really good uh, seller that we work with and they did an excellent job of, 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 of managing the property throughout the, the, the contract process. So they really, and we were checking the financials, you know, every, every week or two weeks and they actually performed better uh, uh, from the time that we went into contract and underwrote the deal until the time we closed, they actually had way better numbers uh, in terms of the performance of the property uh, by the time we took over. So it really just made the transition that much smoother because we weren't in a situation where we had, you know, uh, you know, 10% of the, of the residents that had bailed or people that weren't paying rent. So we took over in a really good situation. Um, now, one of the things that we decided to do uh, with this property, which I think is really important to understand, is that we basically took the idea that, look, you know, normally when we buy these types of deals, we're going to put a bunch of money into them and re- rehabilitate and reposition these deals. And obviously, we're going to raise rents uh, when we do that. This deal, we were going to, we were planning on putting about um, you know, about a million dollars of, of, of work into the property, in, inclusive of exterior improvements and upgrades to the units. Because of the, the whole coronavirus impact and because of the takeover coming in, we didn't want to be that, 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 that new owner that came in and basically started raising rents on everybody, even if we were upgrading the units, because we thought, hey, that's not going to be taken well by people that are down on their luck and people are that are losing their jobs and and I would feel the same way so what we decided to do for this particular takeover was basically put a halt on any of the reposition work that we were going to do and just not upgrade units and basically just take the property as is and go into a holding pattern where we're just going to basically not raise rents for anybody that's already there not upgrade units and not try to charge more for vacant units by upgrading them just rent them out at the economy, uh, economy turns or the basic unit turns. You know, a couple things that'll do on our side, which is good, is that saves us on extra payroll for having a bunch of extra people to turn the units and upgrade them. You know, because if you're putting granite countertops and everything else, as Ryan knows, you've got to have, you know, a little bit more of, 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 a, of a staff to do that. But the other thing is that we can, instead of upgrading these units and just doing an economy turn instead, we can reduce our expenditures for uh, repairs and maintenance and, and make ready turns. Um, so all the way around, um, it was a smooth takeover, uh, because the seller was, was, was really working well to get us through the hump of the, the, the purchase transition. But also we really had a game plan way ahead of time that said that we were going to go with the idea that we were going to manage this like, uh, like any of our other portfolio where we're, we're stopping all of these, you know, upgrade style things and really just giving these residents a real basic functional unit that works fine. But the bales and whistles are on hold because people just can't afford that kind of stuff. Got, right got it. Got it. Got it. Ryan, you're kind of the tip of the spear for your company. What are owners calling you uh, about these days? Well, during this, this thunderstorm? Yeah. And just to kind of back up uh, real quick on what, um, on what JC was saying, it, totally agree. But what I've communicated to owners, Hey, let's, even if, even if they were in the midst of a, a renovation plan, I said, look, uh, let's conserve capital. Let's not do distributions. Let's halt the, the, the upgrade plan. And let's just wait for the dust to settle. And uh, I don't want to speak for JC, but I'm, my guess is in three or four months if the dust is settled, we have clarity going forward and there's demand for higher end product that he'll probably pivot right back to his original plan. And so that's basically totally second, exactly what JC, you know, when, when things are going crazy, conserve your cash, uh, be ready for a rainy day and, um, and just, uh, wait till the t- dust settles. And then, uh, uh, and then, uh, for people that you manage for that don't have a lot of, uh, cash, uh, mm-hmm. how are those conversations going and what are you talking, what are you telling them to do? You know, it, uh, basically what we've instructed and what I've instructed people and what our team has instructed is, you know, don't do the distributions right now. Uh, focus on, uh, you know, keeping the lights on. And, and uh, if they're in a very bad position, we send them to Paul to focus on seeing if they get the moratorium. Um, 
but it, it kind of depends on which which uh, client it, and you know what cash position they're in. Um, it some and, people and have that are very brought, well capitalized are yeah. not too concerned about it. Others that uh, got too aggressive with their underwriting or with their distributions. You know, there's obviously more concern there. We, uh, you know, we've applied for the PPP after a lot of back and forth. It wasn't a, a very clear process at the beginning. So um, I think that that will help uh, provide some relief. Uh, we have to, you know, obviously we have to apply for that as a management company and then, and then we'll, we'll have certain escrow for, for properties. So we think that will help. And then um, if they can get the, you know, if they have to do the, um, I forgot what the terminology is where they have uh, their payment, their mortgage payments, you know, yeah. uh, tacked onto the back end. Yeah. Forbearance. Forbearance, yeah. Forbearance. You know, we're not recommending that to people that don't need to do it. Um, have you brought um, up the, the, the phraseology possibly need a capital call from your investors into the, into the equation yet? I think there has been certain conversations. Uh, me personally, I haven't brought those those things uh, to bear yet. But yeah. um, you know, we're you know we're trying to work with what they have and to just keep them informed of here's where you're at. Here's what we're going to try to do. To uh, you know, we're going to try to pay this one thirty or sixty days out. And we think this vendor will work with us. This vendor will not. They'll put in a lien. Um, you know, but we're dealing a little bit with, and I think that we're probably a little bit conservative going into the end of March because I didn't think that, uh, you know, April we'd end up collecting 85% of our collections or where I think we'll probably end up uh, versus, you know, the 95. So I, I, but we don't know how next month is going to, to transpire. I mean, you know, of course, in our more uh, B class assets, um, that are you know a little better located and have you know a little higher end maybe first or second white collar job out of college type of tenant those ones are handling it a lot better than some of the 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 uh the apartment deals that you know have a lot of people that work in the um, food and beverage and you know restaurants and and stuff so it's just really it's a wait and see thing conserve every bit of cash that you have have you reduced you staff are, in some of these these properties? We're not furloughing staff yet. And, um, you know, most of the properties still need, we weren't like heavily staffed in terms of the uh, management. We have furloughed some of the construction management people. But in terms of the property management, we're still doing emergency work orders. Uh, we're, we are, that's just another thing. If somebody, if a 300 unit has, 20 vacants and we have 10 of them ready we're shutting it off and just having them trash out and do things to to um you know maybe paint the apartments and stuff like that that don't have a lot of cost associated with we're really trying to we have concern that if this is only a 30 to 45 day um uh shutdown or stay at home thing that we don't want to get rid of a bunch of employees um, because it's not easy to rehire him after the fact, and it's not right. You know, I don't think that it's, I mean, we all have a moral uh, uh, duty to, to do what we can to keep it, keep it rolling, but I also don't think it's uh, economically a smart move. Um, same thing with the tenants. I mean, we're doing care packages right now. I'm working on an order from our, uh, our uh, factories to uh, bring in a, uh, several thousand face masks we'd like to if we can get those in time we'd like to have care packages for all of our tenants we've already imported a bunch for our uh employees for me personally and i'll send you guys some if you want it's <laughs> kind of funny that. a lot of the factories uh cordoned off about a quarter of their factory to build uh to and they retooled it to to do face masks so we're bringing in some n95s we'll have I don't think we'll be be able to provide N95s to tenants, but we'll we'll probably be able to provide them with the the blue surgical masks, mm -hmm. and that's something that you know we have an obviously an advantage because we have those relationships and I can get them at cost, and that way we can do them on scale. So we really are focused on people's health first and foremost. We do want our employees to work. So far, they have been able to. We get to a point we can't have people twiddling their thumbs though because we have a fiduciary responsibility to our, to our clients 
that uh, if there's not work for the people to be that, you know, because emergency work orders, you know, we might get through all the emergency work orders to keep the person uh, busy. So it's really a wait and see. I think our first step is going to be um, some sort of cut hours versus cutting, you know, a quarter of the staff. I Maybe mean, we'll just break everybody down to 30 hours a week um, and, and those sorts of things. So that's the approach. We haven't pulled the trigger on any of that at this point. Clearly, we had a bunch of uh, hiring needs that we needed to do, to do pre-COVID-19, and we've shut those off. So we're just working with the staff. But, you know, I think that we were particularly in the maintenance section. I mean, we all know how it was going and up to about February, where it was very difficult to get maintenance people. Yeah. We were short a good 5 to 7% uh, on maintenance people uh, company-wide. And so we're, we're not filling that gap. Yeah. Or, so some of that is going to naturally contract and then we'll have to do hiring thereafter. Um, uh, in terms of, you know, just, I mean, that's basically. Yeah. JC, how about you? Have you kind of changed a little bit of your, your third, your management of these properties with personnel? Yeah. Yeah. I think that uh, just like what Ryan mentioned, you know, the first and foremost, our, our concern is, is to keep the staff intact uh, because one, uh, we just have a great team and, and letting them go. Uh, not only would it be devastating for their families, uh, but also it would be uh, a negative to our company as we ramp back up because it's really hard to find talent, uh, especially maintenance guys. Good maintenance people are really hard to come by. So uh, what we did from our company perspective is because we decided uh, from a company-wide perspective to immediately cease and desist uh, very early on, I mean, this, this was a, a decision we made very early on, to, we, we decided to stop all upgrade uh, programs at the properties and any sort of major capital improvements we, we stopped. Then what we were able to do is we had uh, temporary people that we were temp staffing uh, that we were able to let go because we those guys were only necessary to keep upgrading units. Um, so, so, so those folks did, did come off the, uh, <clears throat> come off the books for the properties, but everybody that was an employee that was there to service uh, stabilized operations at the property have remained in place and there's still plenty of work for them to, to, to do right now. And so our plan going forward is to keep those folks on payroll. The other thing, obviously with the cares act, is the uh, the payroll protection program that Ryan had mentioned the PPP uh, SBA loan? Uh, you know the government allocated about three hundred and fifty billion dollars so far uh, for that, and it's been a little bit of a crazy sort of go around as to how you apply and get it. Um, but because we have a management company um, that has employees, we're we're also able to apply. So we actually applied um, on especially as as a matter of fact last night. Uh, because we're with Wells Fargo Bank, uh, they finally kind of gave us our our, our, uh, our number got pulled to apply. And so we're applying for that. And that's basically going to give us about two and a half uh, months, 2.5 months of, of, of a forgivable loan, uh, uh, per the terms of the CARES Act, a forgivable loan that you can use to pay two and a half months of your, of your employees' uh, salaries. Um, and so we're going to use that to help us to get over the hump and not have to let folks go. Um, just like Ryan said, even if times do get a little rough, which we expect them to get uh, very much more rough in, in the, uh, the May and, and the June timeframe. So, yeah, okay. just to add to that, um, and I'm not an expert on this, probably more of a question for Mal Merrill Callister, but um, you, uh, part of the strings attached to the PPP is that you don't let, you know, I, I know there's thir certain thresholds where you can't let any more than a certain percentage of your, uh, of your employees, uh, you know, let them go. So, yeah, that's right, Ryan. And the way that they're going to, uh, you know, enforce that is that, uh, if you let the folks go, uh, you have to report your, you know, how much, how much payroll you're paying out. And if you let folks go, they're basically going to make that portion that you let go. It, it's going to become, a, a loan that's not forgivable. So, you know, if you let three, four people go, those people, that loan will, will not be forgiven, uh, that portion of that loan. So they, they do have some hooks in place to make sure that you don't get the money and then let everybody go anyways. Uh, Ryan, I'm going to let you have the final word. Any words of wisdom to folks that own multifamily properties out there going into to May and to June? Um, 
Yeah, I'll give a few words. Let me, it's gonna be hard to wrap it up in a few words, but I would say that conserve every bit of cash that you can, um, uh, um, that, that's possible, just like on the, the upgrades and, and all those things, conserve cash. Um, I'm, I'm not suggesting that don't pay your vendors because that's not gonna work out well. Um, you'll, you'll have a lien on your property, but the conserve cash, when there's a choice of spending the money or not, uh, I would err on the side of caution, not spend the money until you have, um, and do not do any distributions, even if right now the, the, the account looks uh, fine. Um, that's the biggest uh, takeaway that I could tell them to do practically in more of a general sense. You know, in these times, I started my business in, in this kind of environment in 2008, eight nine. It was different, but uh, there was a lot of panic at that time as well and really want people to um, rely on your inner strength, your faith, you know, whatever drives you. And, uh, you know, just remember that, um, you know, the people that do well in this environment are not the ones that start off in the, the best place. That usually helps, but it's more the people that uh, don't panic, uh, don't burn their bridges as they're stressing out and, and throwing that on all their employees or their partners or their or their vendors um uh you burn relationships at this time that you're you're very unlikely to ever get them back so really focus um you know focus on using your logic and try not to get too emotional to the best of to the best of your ability those are the people that typically win in these situations or survive so great great words of wisdom on that, Ryan, we certainly appreciate the, you spending some time with us. Again, give me the uh, the website for Wayner Management. So it's uh, Wayner Multifamily. That's W E H N E R Multifamily dot com. Um, there's a contact section there as well, um, and so we, you know, we're. We are, uh, if, if you guys have any questions, if, if, if you don't feel like you're being uh, professionally treated by your property management company through these uh, difficult times, we encourage you to reach out to us. Um, we can be of help and assistance and uh, we can both uh, work together to, to get through all of this. So we really appreciate uh, both of your guys' time and for inviting me to, to speak with you. No problem. And then uh, JC, uh, again, if people don't know what you do, can you tell them very quickly what uh, JC does? Yeah, well, I mean, gosh, uh, you and me and Ryan, we've been buds for a long time. We've been through the, uh, the, great, uh, the great recession. Um, you know, what I do is, you know, I like to help people. Uh, really, at the end of the day, I help people make smart multifamily investment decisions. Um, it's the reason we started the show, to be honest with you. We, like, we love to share expert information from the multifamily side. We don't talk about, uh, you know, we don't talk about uh, how to plant good gardens. We talk about how to do multifamily. If anybody out there has any questions or is looking to get started and has some concerns, or if they're concerned about this time, uh, this crazy economic times that we're in and how that relates to multifamily investing, they can reach out to me to schedule a free 50 minute consultation. Go to our website, multifamilypropertygroup.com. Again, multifamilypropertygroup.com. Go to the contact us section and I'd be happy to schedule a uh, virtual, a Zoom meeting uh, where we can talk about how uh, we might be able to help you out. Paul? I like, yeah, what I like about JC and, and when you make an investment into multifamily, you're dealing with a general partner, managing member like JC and, and Eric Hardy uh, on his team. Imagine if you put money into IBM or JC Pennies or <laughs> anything you can imagine on the New York Stock Exchange you could have a direct conversation with, with these guys versus the guys that have all the, uh, uh, the large companies. You could never have a conversation with the president of IBM, the president of JC Penney's or, or, or anybody. This is what is great when you invest in some of these limited partnerships, these, these general partnerships that buy real estate because you can deal with the, the guys that uh, they're the decision makers and they, they, they know exactly what's going on. So we appreciate uh, uh, JC being so open and communicative to, to his limited partners. That's great. 
Again, we appreciate everybody listening during this time. Again, I'm Paul Peebles. Thanks, Ryan Wainer. Thanks, JC Castillo. We'll see you next time.